Okay. Hi everyone. I'm Florian uh, from Germany, and I will talk about how and why we ended up selecting Rather for a project. Um, first question: Is there anybody in the room who's not using CF Engine? No. Okay. Because in that case, um, <laughs> I can uh, be a little more uh, a little more impolite in some places, which will be interesting. Um, I will first go into some background, then describing the project requirements, and then where I found these requirements to be special and not uh, matching up well with some uh, some tools, and also the comparison of the tools because we had a deep look at most of the bigger players and I will show what I really liked about them and what was kind of stupid and then also what we liked when we uh, found this combination of Rod and CF Engine which CF Engine parts like made us just happy to have same about Rudder and also about this strange perception issue between CF Engine's actual use and like the hype around it because there's a lot of use and the hype thing is work in progress or something. Okay, um, as for the start, my background. Um, in my first job, uh, automation was basically me and we did everything by hand. I did not exactly find out why, even in those years. Uh, I just started working with golden images there because uh, the way of doing we had was pretty stupid. And um, since I came from, from a help desk area, I also had this strange um, wish to not wipe the user's data. So my golden images only wiped the OS and it came with a documentation how he gets his files back after the wipe. Which is not common and is also something you run into with automation like well just redeploy, uh, redeploy the VM, uh, yeah but what about the data, maybe there is some data, no you have to abstract that. And uh, I've been trying to I don't know, tiptoe around and not break things while I work on that. Um, as for automation, my background was like a few train rides in the start and reading the whole infrastructure's mailing arch, right? like six years worth of mail. Because this was like, I was already working in a big Unix place at that time, but uh, we did not automate much either because they were like one of these too big to fail places and they did not want to introduce any programmatic, widespreading errors, so they just let us do things by hand. Um, it was a bit weird, but <laughs> as for that part, it worked. Um, and the, the ISCONF, or Infrastructure Mafia, as they were called back then, was interesting for me because they, there I found that there is actually people that like um, do not hand out the root passwords, reset them on each time you log into a box, run everything from LDAP, and so on. And so I came into this idea of really automating things. Um, the problem was, I came through a few places that did automation. There was this one place, they are currently at this stage, they are now running Chef and Hotsquare or HP Server Automation. But they are like, sorry. Um, the thing is they are constantly transitioning, so they are not settling in with the tool. Um, from what I think is, because they have bad API interfaces on the one end, and uh, I'm not sure what else, but they're constantly misusing it either. So um, with CF Engine, back in the start, they actually packed the CF files into RPM packages and pushed those out via RPM. Like, I don't know why, but this is just what they did. And I found this packaging of config is kind of an anti-pattern. It's being done more often. I don't know why. Um, the next one I had to work with uh, was a self-written thing. It is, was um, like the Ansible pull mode, so you had a set of config which was hard built into the OS images. It was for a closed system, so you did not have to support changes, basically. Um, but there is a difference between rolling out a hard fixed configuration, which is hard, uh, like well-defined and a tool which can also apply them if, if something breaks because our tool would only apply once and then if the server had an issue, this corruption, anything, it would stay broken. There was nothing to fix anything. 
Um, yeah, and if you do testing and you had an environment with like 50 high availability clusters, it takes some time, especially with DRPD swings of 6, 10 hours or something. And so this was also like a tool which sucked to work with. The last special thing I found, um, which is also going to end up as a router install, um, was a self-written config management. I don't know why that person wrote it. Um, I have like been inquiring and the only thing I f uh, could find out was that he said he was also a bit unhappy at that place and didn't know what to do. Something like this. So there is a config management. You define everything in XML, which is really helpful if you're a human and you're the, um, like the person giving the input, so you have to wrap it into XML for some reason. Uh, it's then partially stored in MySQL. The other uh, half goes to SVN. And yeah, it also packages during the build process some of the configuration into basic FreeBSD config files. So you also have to push out new package states just to update a user. I don't know why people do that, but they tend to do it. It's just uh, uh, horrible. Um, so I found it's, it's really necessary to have a tool set to kick out existing configuration systems mm -hmm. and come back with one that maybe does not handle every special golden screw they had, but does the basic configuration management well, instead of fiddling around with strange stuff. Um, I went at that in two ways. When Ansible came out, I started working with it very early and uh, used it even at some bigger scale. And since this was a very easy tool and I knew it, I also picked CF Engine to have the other end covered. And I thought, okay, if I learn both of them, I will probably be able to navigate and use whatever comes up and, and learn to, how to abstract things. Yeah, and so that's why I said I have like Ansible as the hammer for a single um, one-off change, for example, and CF Engine is if I need to automate everything. Um, like the, the, the largest thing I did with Ansible was changing a few thousand NFS mounts while everything was running, and there it's nice uh, because it aborts an error. If you look at that from a configuration management point of view, it's not really, not really helping. I don't want it to abort an error. I wanted to deal and, and think about the next step, which is kind of what CF Engine is better at. Um, from the aftermath of this Ansible NFS thing, uh, I was asked to look at another project, which was um, having very specific requirements and they didn't have people like around which knew uh, to deal with something like that. So I, I, picked, uh, like I picked some of them, and I hope I also managed to add a few of the conflicts which really existed in there. But I will start, as usual, at the end. There's hundreds of admins. They do different stuff. They're in different departments, and it, doesn't, uh, it does, of course, overlap in some places, but um, like guy A might be uh, allowed to change B's config, but he might not be allowed to do everything with that, and it goes on, on and on like that. So uh, delegation was something that came up with that. Auditing also. And ideally also some role-based accounting so you could actually limit what people can do. Um, this also uh, can mean the death of templates. Uh, like if two people are allowed to edit the same thing it, would, it gets hard with introducing it over the same variable. Um, yeah, they wanted a working API, which is uh, a reason why many products like fall out. And yeah, reporting would also have been nice. Uh, and rollbacks. So th this is like, they just wanted everything. Um, I tried to drill it down a little bit. Uh, and also to find out what we really uh, would need um, so an admin team can work with the tool in the end because that also matters. Mm -hmm. And so, like the first and most important point was actually people should be able to, to work with the policy, otherwise it doesn't work out. And that was of course a point where I had troubles thinking about CF Engine because if there's like 
I don't know, 100 people in India, who all have real issues with LS and other tools like this. It gets hard to um, let them work with CF Engine syntax files and just run what they do. So it needed some wrapper or something which make this, makes it nicer. But the next step is also uh, already reliability. And that's again um, one where CF Engine really shines. Um, but these were really the core things. And the scalability was also quite a tricky one. Uh, there's currently a few thousand servers, but the requirements were strictly asking for scalability. So with like containers coming around the corner and so on, it's not like you think of scalability as it would like uh, they would like to be double it, uh, in size, but it might be 10 or 20 fold. So there was some, some thinking into that. Okay, with these ideas uh, as the main things to go after, I looked at different tools. Uh, I've gone alphabetical, so this is really neutral at the moment. Uh, Ansible, well, it, it's very easy for someone to read Ansible policy. They will not be able to make out like larger interdependencies from just reading it, but uh, basically it's nice. It has a mode where it can print out uh, whatever steps are in a playbook and you can show that to a manager. This is the stuff we're going to change. Of course, that's not as cool as it looks if you show it to him, but he's happy. Um, they have an incredibly good support model for consultants like me, because I give them like $1,000 a year and they help me. That's it. It's not related to production support, but if you need to bring up a project, it's a really easy way to get in. But you cannot pay via PayPal, so this is why I never paid it so far. <laughs> um, the problems are the performance thing. Ansible is really easy to deploy because it works with SSH. Um, it has tweaks to be fast, even in a scalable setup, but those tweaks go, only go to a certain point. And each box that is down actually already slays it, uh, slows it down. <coughs> there is a message queuing mode, which only is possible if you know every firewall admin in the whole company, because otherwise you won't get the ports open to even run that mode. So this, like it has paper features to solve scalability problems, but they're uh, tricky in, real, uh, in, in reality. Um, and, well, there is no way to report if you're running in a pool-based mode because it runs from cron and doesn't know who to talk to. It also constantly changes. They add features, um, deprecate their syntax like ha every half year. So if you had something that really works and is well tested for your production, if you do an update, it will just not run anymore. That's not so good. And the worst thing is the complex stuff. If you start writing Ansible policy, it's nice, it's fun. Let's say you have this graph here, and this is your like complexity level. This is all easy and easy. And then I use this point where you have a ginger hazard error because you write YAML files with ginger variables in there. And it's all gone nice. You listed your tasks, your tasks, your tasks. They have nice names. Everybody understands what they do. And then here comes this stupid parser error. And suddenly, all you try to do it in Jinja. Oh, damn it. You can't do that in Jinja because this variable thing you want to do is not Python compatible in the syntax. OK, so you look up the Jinja docs. Uh, damn it. Jinja can't do it. So you need a Python module. Oh, uh, and now I'm out of space. This is how it goes. Then you sorted that, and you drop down back here to this easy level, and you go on for a day and add stuff, oh, and then it jumps again. And at some point you're really annoyed. And it's, I mean, being annoyed is not a big problem. You're paid to work, but the thing is if you uh, think about other people to work with it, and they have to run into something like that at night, it's not as funny, and it might break stuff. And so, this easy tool was nice, but I got the feeling it's better to have one which has complexity, but at least it stays at the same level. And during the Relic class, or CF Engine class, I took some time, I found out with CF Engine it was the opposite. If I do complex stuff, it gets, easy, uh, it gets easier and easier. It's really hard for getting started, doing the basic things, easy stuff, 
uh, but I don't have to worry that it will fall into my face or something if I do something complex, because that just works. But uh, Ansible was out at that point. Um, this was my CF engine. Uh, like I, I condensed it. It's rudder and enterprise and not enterprise. I went through all of them. Um, the scalability, the robustness is easy, complex stuff, and also the point smarts. So you have display time and all these mechanisms, which other tools don't even yet have. They might have them in two or three years. See if engine might have them for, I don't know, 15 years. So it's like, uh, <clears throat> at some point you, you feel, well, see if engine, the, all the, the, the standard promises, it's really uh, a lot of stuff, and you're not sure if half of them is still being used, but uh, you also notice that CF Engine has covered most problems ages ago, which other ones don't even yet start to cover. And yeah, as a sysadmin, that's a good feeling. Um, the readability, I gave it like two minuses or three on that. Uh, on the other hand, since it has uh, fields for reports, and like, uh, like you said yesterday, um, tries to enforce documenting why I'm doing something and what I'm doing. Uh, this is not as bad as it seems, but I want it to be like uh, neutral. I liked it a lot, so maybe I ranked it down a little longer. Yeah. Um, the effort thing, at least in the beginning, people will not know when they're done with uh, implementing something, but since there is NCF, that's not a problem anyway. And what I did not know back then was uh, there is like this whole lot of C code, or C++, I have no idea, in CF Engine. And uh, at some point, uh, I ran into a core dump because my SSH keys were too large. And there I had some, let's say, unhappy meeting. Because I was like, yep, uh, just for your information, I managed to make a core dump. Now, we know it's just a core dump. But normally, if something can core dump, I can also exploit it. We don't know, we don't want to know, but uh, also I looked it up and it wasn't as bad, but it's just giving a, a very strange feeling when you are in this world of interpreted tools who maybe give a trace back and <laughs> run into one which of course is in C because it's supposed to be stable and keep running even if your system is half broken. I get it. Uh, it's just it didn't feel well exercised on the code side. Um, yeah, but the obvious thing was to fix it, and that was also an interesting point, because um, the Reddit people normally are incredibly fast with workarounds. So, uh, yeah, we, we had this experience that they fix stuff a lot faster than the CF Engine, and that was good. <laughs> um, on the chef side, uh, it was also fine in scalability because at that point they had already uh, rewritten their core, so that would have been okay. It felt modern. The API, at least in the enterprise version, is great. I don't remember what the status was with the community version. Maybe there is issues with the API, I just don't remember. Their pre says was godlike. And um, what was interesting, uh, it, we loved it from the operations side. We also found many devs like it. Uh, whereas you find many statements by people that like Ops wants Puppet and Dev wants, CF and, uh, wants Chef. Mm. I did not find anyone in the Ops area who wanted to use Puppet when they could have Chef. So this was one of the first points where I found that many of these statements you, you find are just bullshit. Um, yeah, where it lost. <laughs> That was just three, four, uh, three points, but they were big. First of all, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, fully open source back then. It changed by now, but bad luck for them. And the web interface was like a joke. Um, the um, chef web interface lets you assign permissions on policy pieces and lets you edit them. The problem is, you have like you, you wrote a policy for your server or for packages or for whatever. It's maybe 500 lines, and there is a segment which you are allowed to edit. And you click on edit, and then you see five lines, five lines of Ruby code, and 
you don't know what's above them and not what's below them. So this is really the worst web interface I've ever seen. Um, if you try to edit anything in there, you have like an insane chance that it will just break everything. And you won't even know it. Uh, yeah, and last, uh, the Ruby client wasn't really making friends. Uh, um, because there was no Ruby. So why should people spend hundreds of gigabytes <laughs> to roll out Ruby <laughs> in this uh, client installer if they don't need it? And the uh, last thing was uh, one of the highlighted chef features is the cookbook. So you have, uh, I think, 2,500 pre-made uh, config policies. Uh, let's say 10 of them configure Apache. But they're all like for Apache configuration at a small startup which doesn't run anything complicated. And if you have a real sophisticated setup, none of, uh, like you're down from 10 options to zero because none of them works with that. So uh, yeah, that's like the, the ecosystems are just not as valuable as one would think. Uh, we also had a look at the, the auto HP server automation or Opsware, which is known to scale really well. Um, I did not li uh, yeah, it has all the role-based accounting and feature stuff. It can merge software repositories and branch and, and everything. It's just in there. The problem is, I don't even know the price, and we kind of had the feeling we shouldn't even ask, because it's probably too expensive for anybody. And yeah, I managed to find the API documentation for the most recent version. It took about one and a half hours, and it's hidden at some idiotic forum at HP, uh, which also lets you find that there's almost no users posting for the forum. So you can, install, you can implement it, and HP will sell you people you can uh, hire, so they come to your place, and you have to, somebody who, can, uh, he, who you can talk with about Opsware. But you won't talk to another user, because they don't relate or anything. So you're just on your own with that. And it's a good business model for HP, but we didn't really like it. And uh, well, last um, was Puppet. Uh, it has a working web interface. It has working role-based accounting in the enterprise version. We did not look at the normal one. And the thing was about scalability mostly. Uh, no one in the whole project thought we could trust Puppet to scale up. It might have handled the current size, with the, or at least with the more, uh, most modern server, it might have, uh, but not this scalability thing. Well, how about we use 40,000 boxes or something? Like that. It wasn't believable. Yeah. OK, so this is what I found with the tools. Um, mm -hmm. I go a little towards what is actually running in that area, and why <laughs> did it get so tricky? So um, the production is something industrial. So that means you have a constant 24-7 operation and things can break. And if they're broken, they're broken. It's not like you can redeploy a web application or something. It's just broken after that point. Um, that means you have certain requirements for uptime and also for how the config management tool actually does its changes. Um, yeah, I was digging into CF Engine some more and found there is like very little buzz about it and still it tends to be everywhere. Um, I have been digging into sizes of setups because that was not an ignorable factor. Um, the same statement, or actually not the same, this one is pretty um, understating, and this is pretty overstating. So there's people who are running one of the modern tools, and they go like, yeah, we, we have this DevOps team with 200 people, uh, uh, no, 200 boxes. And it's a really large and complex setup. And you think like, okay, so this company is around for two years, and they have 200 boxes, and it's a complex setup, okay? And they build everything from scratch, so they also didn't have to respect their existing servers or anything. This is not a complex setup. This is just, yeah, I, I can do that in OpenAppDealer tomorrow. It's okay. Maybe I have to put in some more RAM, but that's it. That's your setup. 
and the guys running CF Engine, they were like, mm, yeah, it works, we have a few thousand boxes in, uh, boxes in there, and that's it. So they didn't go into any detail. Uh, <laughs> the, the thing is, uh, they, they are just used to it working, I think. Um, like Martin yesterday, he gave a long talk about how to um, present it, and it, in some line he said, yeah, we have this 3,500 boxes converted. So each of these setups is like 50 typical chef startups, and it just works. But I think that's why you uh, hear so little about it. The only public reference in a comparison was uh, the Mike Swoboda thing with LinkedIn, and they had somebody using Salt, somebody using Puppet, and somebody using Ansel. Oh no, not Puppet, but Chef. And the other setups were all in the range of 50 to 400 boxes. I checked, and most of them wrote something about that it's a large setup. And they also gave rather basic answers. And Mike obviously had the time to give real good replies because his were like 10 times the size. And he had 40,000 boxes or something like this. And he just noticed that the CF engine places seem to be more relaxed in their operations. And also, they seem to think about what they do. At least that was my takeaway, and it's really easy to Google examples like that. It's, it's, I don't know, I haven't encountered that in any other kind of software. So, mm, still this was a phase where I was just asking around and, and comparing things. So, at some point, uh, I had been sitting here with a friend, who is also in IT, but I hadn't seen him for 10 years or something. And I knew we got beer over there, and like with our third or fourth beer, um, we came to this point. He said, yeah, our oh, config management, yeah, we had this other stuff, it's like a shell nightmare, it pushes, and the config is really fragile, and it doesn't really work, but uh, we have a, a, like if, if your CF engine thing doesn't come around, we also have a pro project around that. Uh, because corporation IT, the big one, already has a few 10,000 hosts on CF Engine, and so we can just switch to it now, and we're really happy. They had uh, a mobile development department with a few hundred systems, and the corporation is a chip manufacturer. And it's not, I mean, AMD is very public about that, running CF Engine. It's not AMD, it's the other one. And so, here is CF Engine, there is CF Engine, the next phase of CF Engine, and I got this notion maybe it's something about having an industry around it. And yeah, then the suspicion of mine was if there is actually a production running, not just money being pushed around or web users accessing their mailboxes, it tends to be CF Engine. Um, yeah, it's, it's the stuff with things as a Mark Burgess uh, quote, which I think seems to be the, the um, hinge point for running CF Engine. Uh, because uh, this is like the Tesla factory, and in such an environment, you, you cannot test or anything. You can, when you're building the factory, for a week, for five weeks maybe, but then it's running. And if you still want to run a change on a computer here, it, it will be tricky if you aren't sure it's working, or if your tool doesn't like handle this gracefully. Um, if you look for this picture, you'll also find a video from Tesla, and they nicely show their factory and robots working. So there's this one in the front, and it slowly picks up a piece here and gives it to the next one. The thing is, these robots um, move, uh, move at three meters per second, and all of them move in reality. I found it's, uh, this is why it took so long last night, um, I found it's uh, apparently a marketing thing, if a company shows their production robots, they make them really slow or just show one because people probably get afraid if all of them moves. Like everything is racing around. It seems just uh, that they're afraid that people say, oh yeah, I don't like robots. Um, the thing is, if I uh, introduce any arrow here and I have to stop that, it's not the ju just the one here, it's all of them. So that means any breakage doesn't mean a breakage of the part here, it means all. And so you have a production loss. <laughs> That's where our terms come from. And 
It's also a funny thing to talk with corporations like that about automation because they invented it. And so um, they tend to, like, like the IT guys, they're still fine, they're like us, but the corporation itself has higher expectations because they've been doing it for 100 years. Um, yeah, okay, so the templates thing, I will skip that. I didn't like it. Um, the, the thing was, um, it seemed we would need CF Engine, and then we got really lucky finding a web interface which actually makes it manageable for different kinds of people. Um, I've been going with the example of like a heavy platform for uh, moving, let's say, the space shuttle. These things got wheels, and you can turn them as you want, and they make a really high load, easily transportable. And uh, so, in CF Engine, I, I see the same thing. It's possible to do anything people want. And on the other hand, if we put rudder in front and then CF, we, we give them the choice. If it's easy enough for um, one operator to use NCF and he can, can get his task done, well, then he has his tool. If he finds out, wow, this is a really hard task, he might go to someone else and ask that guy. But, um, yeah, it, it's enabling most of the people to work with config management. And this combination is rare, and I don't think it exists anywhere else. Um, yeah, this, this goes to the same direction. Uh, we're back at the templates, which I just skipped. Uh, for easy stuff, I can do, use templates. Like I have my the, the classic examples, the NTP config, uh, the DNS config. That's nice. But I might also have a bootloader config, which I don't uh, like. I just want to enable serial console there, and I don't want to roll out a, comp, uh, a template of my bootloader config because then I probably lose. So I can just pick the right things. Um, what else was nice in Safe Engine Land? Uh, I don't even remember the background of that exactly anymore. Um, I remember if I do something in a template in CF Engine, it will be a relatively fresh data. Whereas in tools like Ansible, uh, it will be stale. Like it, they have a certain call which is used to find fresh information, and that's when it happens. You can trigger it then your uh, whole playbook slows down again for a, f a few minutes. In CF Engine, it's just nicer. Um, then, yeah, that, that, the, the time thing was also a point where you just noticed you're dealing with a professional tool because it, like you don't have to tell it about time zones or anything. The agent has his local time. If I use some, some more naive tool, let's say Ansible, let's say Salt, whatever, which just pushes out centrally, um, that's useless. It's a worldwide cooperation, and you don't want to do uh, a change during daytime at the one place and at night at the other. It, it, it's, it's not supposed to be like that. So uh, in CF Engine, the agent just knows um, it's local time, and you can uh, put policies on that. That's a lot nicer. And also, uh, a good bonus point was not needing networking. Like, if customers go really crazy and they want to secure something heavily, well, they can make a toggle of the config files, rather pre compile them for each node, so there's no uh, leakage of data or anything, it's just a config for this single node, and, well, you make a toggle, you copy it to your DMZ box, and then you have the config there, and it's able to run for years. Um, yeah. <laughs> Come on, it's okay. Um, and the, the final winning point, I didn't yet mention at all for Rudder is change management. Because uh, like, I was talking with one guy uh, who helped me a lot, Mario Susea, uh, he's a chef consultant in San Francisco. Um, and I had been asking him about change management too. Uh, like he uh, recommended I should use service back. And I asked more people and some use Waybrand or run different Git, Git branches, but it, the thing is, they didn't understand what change management is. Change management means I'm thinking about if I want to do that change, and somebody higher up tells 
me that I am allowed to run this change and it is put into some system. Uh, I found most people don't know that. They have never heard of running um, yeah, like professional IT in some case, uh, like making decisions beforehand. They know I push to the dev branch and then there's an automated test and everything, which is nice if I'm just responsible to myself. But like, if I'm responsible to these other things, like the robots, it's not as good. Uh, yeah, and the, the most fun part is these aren't those systems separate. Like, you go to somebody and say, uh, yeah, I have this problem, and there is these systems which, could uh, which are running in 24-7 production, and they're industrial systems. And they say, yeah, but aren't those separate? And they should be protected. And then you're like, yeah, it's about those systems. Like a factory control. Of course it's separate, but somebody has to manage the conflict there. And uh, like you, you have this, we, we try to um, put our minds at ease and just say, yeah, that's a separate system. It will be well protected. It has its own firewall. And yeah, somebody professional will do that. That's like the meme. And then you say, yeah, but it's about that. Oh, well, then I have to re really think hard and they, they disappear or something. Um, so I try to summarize that. Uh, one break squirts out, and if you have broken parts, you cannot redeploy them. They're just crap, and you have to take them out. So it's also not just like you lose, I don't know, if you produce this chair, it's not the chair being broken, it's the chair being stuck somewhere on a conveyor and it has to be carried out before you can make the next one. So these outages are really ugly. Uh, and yeah, I also wanted to show um, change management isn't about covering your own ass. That's not the point, it's about taking responsibility. So in a company you have people who are at that level, it's not you, it's not me. Um, but somebody has to sign off this stuff and say, okay, next week we're gonna try to run, uh, to roll our configuration update out. And without the change management, this is just not possible. Um, most tools I looked at, they don't support anything like this. I mean, you, you can of course like hack it somehow, uh, I don't know, make uh, uh, one more Git hook or something. Ansible has a way to send an email and then to wait for a human accepting the, ta uh, the change. So you, you could do that. Then there's this guy who gets like 1,000 emails per day and he has to click something and then it proceeds. Uh, I don't think this is how you run production. And in Ansible it's a lot nicer. Uh, no, <laughs> in Rudder it's a lot nicer. Um, you get the web interface, it shows the changes, and the person signing them off can be enforced to be a different one than the one who created the change. Um, and he can actually look at the diff of the config. So it's not just like he has to click yes, like in a normal change advisory board or something, where they all say, oh yeah, that looks good, let's, let's say yes. But he ha really has a, look, a way to look at the config difference. And only if he agrees with that, he can pu uh, push it on forward. It's not perfect, but it's the only thing that is around. Um, yeah. My wish would have been that other tools stop <coughs> playing stupid. Like, uh, I hate these sentences, uh, our, our source is the truth. Uh, no, the truth is what your company goals are, or what, you, what your boss said you should do. Uh, like, this, the source is the truth is a nice escape mechanism. If I make a mistake, and it's in the source, it's still truth, so I'm not guilty, I'm not faulty. Uh, I didn't do a mistake. Um, if you don't, or if you only do inline documentation, that's the same thing. Uh, it, it's just not okay. And in Rudder, I have an audit log, and I can put information info, uh, on each uh, config item I have. So, there's a description field, there is a lengthy description field. I can push those from the API if I want to automatically put them. But I can make sure there is real documentation to find out why something was put in there. And other tools don't have it, and uh, it really feels like a joke to me. Like, uh, it's okay at home. No, no question. Or if, if I'm doing a startup and I have to change everything every two days, I won't bother documenting. I see that, it's okay. But they're trying to sell, to upsell, to high-end places or something, and they come along with that. It's a joke. Um, yeah. Sorry?
I just skip. Okay. Ah, yeah. And the only um, the specialties in Rudder were they don't run a tree view, so you have to uh, like you, you cannot just inherit policy from one box to the next. You have groups, and it's a more horizontal is it that way? Yeah. Uh, scheme where you opt in and out for a single system or for a group of systems to certain policies. It works nicely. Um, the problem is I haven't found an easy way to explain it and one has to work with it for multiple days to get used to it and, and to make full use of it. Uh, by now I think it works better than what you, use, what you usually have with these trees and inheritance features. But it's not easy to like wrap your, ma uh, wrap your mind around. Um, yeah, and the best thing was really um, to find that policies for systems are pre-compiled to only contain the stuff which goes to that system. We, we didn't have that in the requirements. I was of course aware that could be a problem, like if you leak information to some box and rather just took care of it. So that was the most awesome part. Um, yeah, and also did the workarounds, that was helpful. Like, in, we ran into some incredibly crazy bugs. Uh, for example, I made test policies to put sanity permissions. Like, the root file system should belong to root. Like, like uh, the, the 20 most likely errors to break your system or lock you out. I thought that's a good thing to introduce at the start. And then I found that if I had var and var lib in there, it would, would suddenly switch to recursion yes and change the permissions on everything. And with a lot of ugly debugging and uh, help from Nomation, we found out that if you had an array with, I think, 11 elements, it was just uh, like bit shift or something and turn on the recursion. Um, I was very happy that I didn't add the full lab at that time because otherwise <laughs> it would have been a lot of boxes to fix. Um, yeah. Also, uh, one point which really wins over CF Engine, it, uh, uh, people to CF Engine, is things like the fail site or now update CF. Uh, like, it gives them safety. Normally, with, with a config management project, you put a lot of effort into making people not afraid of the tool. And so far, it looks like we managed by saying this is a complex tool, it's the most powerful around. But look what they took care of. They took the, uh, they care about broken config downloads. They make sure they don't nuke the central servers. They're adding a feature to throttle bandwidth. Um, they have multiple templating mechanisms. Yes, you can access JSON data. Yes, you cannot, as you want. And they didn't get afraid so far, not at all. Uh, yeah, that's it. Any questions? Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> I tried to. Okay. Then, thank you. And. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed your criticism you had uh, in relation to the different configuration management systems. One question that perhaps you are the right person to ask is, if you had to start over again from scratch, what would it look like? It would be, for more, for <laughs> it would be more focused about um, internet working of systems. Like, um, the thing is I don't manage just one box. I understand that reliably managing one box and managing multiple are different topics. Uh, but like, I, I would like a tool that lets me express this is a cluster in like one line where it actually auto detects it from, I don't know, reading the Veritas config or something and it won't patch both boxes at the same time and it will simply by itself have the smarts to see one of them is broken so I will not proceed, something like this. Um, uh, these are all just two parts. It's, it's, uh, I mean, there's a logic to it uh, to, to identify if one of the two systems is broken or something, but mostly it's about a uh, tool set. And this is not available in most programs. And like, 
I can write a good script to update the system. I can write uh, a good script for this other task. What I can't write good stuff for is expressing a high, high availability clusters or also uh, like things like patch windows, for example. It would be a lot easier if I, I mean, we can push it with the key value now, but if I just said, this is a production system and I take the SLA data the company has, the definitions, and hook them into the tool, and it just does the right thing and identifies, okay, the system has no fixed patch window. Uh, dear Florian, what should I do? Instead, I will sit there and make a, like a, a policy to handle that. But it's not built into the framework, I'm adding it. So it, uh, it will look a bit like Ansible, adding this feature here, adding there, and so on. And basically, we're systems and network administrators, uh, administrators, and we only have a tool for one of those sites. And I don't mean managing the switches, I don't care about that very much, but I mean managing a whole data center needs a policy language that lets me express that. Which of the tools is closest to that idea? Um, I think CF Engine Enterprise. Because there you have some, you can uh, uh, actually have, what is the term, chef, I think it's data bucket or something. Y you can make a central registry of uh, con um, config values in, and it's queryable. Remote scale? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I think there's a marketing term for it too. <laughs> yeah, but these things, um, they're closest and uh, I mean, it, otherwise Ansible has it pretty nicely because it can do things like only proceed if that port is open uh, on the other box or something like that. It has built-in delegations, so you can say, uh, I want to mount a ISO file on the server, so I delegate to the VM host to attach it. That's possible, but it's too shitty to use. But yeah, that, there you have a few of these options, and there's uh, um, the author also said that he wanted to have something that knows about networking. Uh, but yeah, uh, if I think CF Engine Enterprise with the remote thing. And uh, what's the gap that would make it perfect? Make a wish. <laughs> Data interfaces. So you don't uh, even, like, I'm not an API, API programmer, but uh, some idiot compatible uh, API interfacing. So I can just say, okay, here's my CMDB and please connect. Something in that direction. Uh, with a focus on giving info back towards uh, monitoring or management. Like, like, it should be driven on business values. That's, that's the thing. Thank you. Thank you for your